You are listening to Armchair Healthcare, a podcast on pills, placebos, and policy. Welcome to Armchair Healthcare. Nat is still on maternity leave, so Brianna is with us. And uh, we have a lot of news to actually cover. We had ESMO just last last weekend, and there was some really good data that, that came out of it. You know, there was uh, Olaparib data in uh, newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer and, um, you know, as a maintenance therapy. And, you know, one of the issues is that, you know, of the people who, you know, respond to first-line therapy and have no evidence of disease after treatment, 70% have a relapse within three years. So if you give maintenance olaparib, the hazard ratio shows that your, your risk of death goes down by 70%. So this is this is really like some of the best Kaplan-Meier curves that I've seen. If you, if you look at the curves, I mean, the kind of the median progression-free survival hasn't been reached yet, and it's... And, you know, the curves go out like four years. So it, it's, you know, it's it's really striking. So anyway, some great news uh, for ovarian. Uh, well, this is for BRCA positive ovarian cancer patients. Right. So the PARPs have been good for them in the past and look like, you know, they're continue with some even even better data. PARPs just have a really nice, like straightforward mechanism of action for these BRCA cancers. Yes, with, you know, which is really nice. So it, it's just always great to see you know biotech doing, continuing to do, do good for for people. Absolutely. Um, so that's really positive. And then also Loxo uh, had some data treating uh, TRK fusion cancer. Um, so they had a response rate of eighty percent in kind of multiple cancers that have this sort of you know mutation. Right. So I think the mutation just means that, um, so this like NTRK gene fuses with unrelated genes causing this overexpression of TR, of the TRK, TRK protein. And it's rare, but it does occur in a lot of different types of cancers in adults and in pediatric patients. Um, but you're right. The overall response rate was really, um, it was promising for a bunch of these cancers. Yeah, and you had like uh, 18% complete responses. Uh, and I mean, it literally covered, I mean, they had data on 12 different cancers from infantile fibrosarcoma, uh, pancre- you know, pancreatic cancer. That unfortunately was not a complete response. Um, that one's always a tough one. Uh, you know, colon cancer, lung, whatever. Uh, I didn't, there's appendix cancer. I didn't even know that. I was thinking you, you could just Can't take you just it out. just remove it? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, I don't have have an appendix, so <laughs> hopefully I won't uh, have to deal with that one. Other news is that this morning, you know, when we were recording this, so it was announced that Trump's going to announce a drug pricing policy. Yes. So they're they're looking to do some relatively radical stuff. I mean, when I say they, I mean uh, CMS. So they're going to look for, look at um, pay, paying doctors a flat fee instead of ASP plus six percent. Right. So if it's more of like, a, I guess, a, a bundling or DRG sort of method, then they won't be incentivized to use the higher price medications. Okay. Um, and by the way, this will all be for Medicare Part B. So what's actually administered in the doctor's office or hospital, not you know, the Medicare Part D drugs. Okay. And so th- like that will probably piss off a lot of doctors because, you know, they do make money on that plus 6%, especially with oncology drugs getting more more expensive. Absolutely. And then also they're looking to do this sort of international reference pricing. So they'll have, they'll create an index where U.S. drugs will be benchmarked against 16 other nations. And then they'll, they'll try to get prices to international levels over the course of five years. And Alex Azar, um, he, he sent, uh, tweeted out this report from HHS that showed that, you know, kind of what different drugs cost Medicare Part B right now. And what would be the price if they were at an international volume weighted average price? So you have like Rituxin, uh, you know, right now costs Medicare Part B about 1.7 billion, um, but if at the international price it would be only like 639 million. So they would save a billion dollars. So it's just on that one drug. 
Um, you know, other savings would be for like like Nalasta is a lot. That's almost a billion. Ilea, uh, Exgiva, Lucentis. It looks uh, like the Rituxin one is really just the outlier. Well, I mean, it's the highest, but I mean, there's other ones that are about a billion. And so if you if you just the grand total for the top 20 drugs is the they're spending 17.2 billion and they think they'll be able to save 8.1 billion just with this international reference pricing. Right. So that that's pretty major and all of these are biologics and it's pretty clear they're targeting the biologics. I think it was actually stated in the political Politico article that um yeah you know, they're they're targeting basically you know single source drugs which tend to be more expensive whether generic or branded and then also biologics. It's pretty interesting just to look at the differences between like the 2016 data that they have um, just juxtaposed with the average uh, price for those 16 countries just to look at the difference it's really interesting yeah no i mean it's it was i mean for some of these they're not that necessarily that different but right. like for a lot of them they they really are um like i mean remicade for example it's like 1.3 billion versus 1.1 billion internationally so that's like you know a, a high uh, a high use drug that's really relatively comparable. And I think a lot of this is just going to be through kind of the federal rulemaking process. So it doesn't have to go through Congress, but Congress obviously does have oversight. So I'm not sure exactly how all of this is going to work. Right. But I'm pretty sure Congress will be in arm up in arms about this because a lot of them are in the pocket of pharma. So uh, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, I know Obama tried to do something similar at the end of his term but then i guess well that was like a presidential election year so probably no one wanted to like piss off any donors right of course so, you know uh it, it didn't get off the ground so so we'll see what happens here but it looks promising i mean it's not exactly the standard republican model of international reference pricing i mean that's not something that you you would ever think a, a gop president would move forward with but like hey if uh i don't i don't think any of the the uh Farm companies will starve on the lower prices and, you know, we will be able to maybe, you know, bend the curve a little bit yeah. on, on all of this because, you know, the spending is, is pretty crazy. And it seems pretty fair. Yeah. It's just like, hey, you know, y your, your prices are X in all of these countries. Of course, you know, it will make a lot of things more complicated. Like if you are a U.S.-based biotech and you've outlicensed your ex-U.S., Right. right. So then really kind of your U.S. pricing is going to be at the mercy of what your partner is saying. So you'll probably have to pre-negotiate. I'm sure there's some uh, some language on pricing, but I think it will be like have to be really nailed down. Right. So they can't really undercut it too much because that will just hurt your U.S. Absolutely. Sales. But these are things that can all be worked out. Yeah, exactly. You shouldn't be apocalyptic about this, but it, it, it's, it makes it a little bit more sane and makes you know, us as U.S. citizens feel a little less bad about like, why are we being shafted while like kind of the rest of the world gets cheaper prices? And, Absolutely. and these are, a lot of these are our companies. So was it IQVIA came out with an orphan drug report? Um, and that just kind of also kind of just reiterated how, how kind of our, our price system is really kind of messed up. So they looked at um, specialty drug pricing and orphan drug pricing. And um, in terms of like share of total market spending, specialty drugs are about like 45%, uh, but they're only about 2% of actual volume in units. Um, and that's similar to kind of numbers I, I've seen before. And, but then like on the orphan drug side, we're up to 9% 9, 9 of total spending is on orphan drugs. I think it's like actually 9.6%. But the, in terms of volume, it's less than half a percent and it's actually falling so like there, there's there's a chart there which shows like okay prices are rising but usage is falling as a well usage share is falling right it's been falling since around 2007 just a bit of a disconnect there um i know people are like oh it's just it's just 200 patients or or you know there, it's, it's a small indication it's not really gonna hurt anyone but we have a lot of those indications now yes we do and they add up and now it's like 10 percent you know, of our spending is going to half a percent of the people, which I know it doesn't necessarily sound very much, but considering we just said 45% of spending goes to 2%, but it's, it's, it's all part of the same, same problem. 
I mean, look, the, it's not like the margins on these are low, and so they're really justified in, in paying these high prices. I mean, the margins of drugs are usually very high compared to other products. And then the, the margins of the pharma sector as a whole is like triple the average margin of any other sector or all the other sectors combined. Um, so it's not like they're, they're really justified even with their R, it, when taking into account their R&D spending. They don't really spend that much of their sales on R&D. Right. So, so yeah, we got to fix this issue. Looks like the administration's going to start with Medicare Part B. We'll see what, what happens there. Yeah, well, I mean, we'll see if this was really just an election-based stunt or not. Right. Two two weeks, two and a half weeks from from now will be um, the midterms. Yeah, so it'll it'll be interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see. Definitely. Kind of other other interesting news. Oh, in terms of price, since since we're on the pricing subject, uh, Amgen announced uh, that they're cutting the cost of Rapatha, their PCSK9, by sixty percent. Uh, so the, they're cutting the list price from fourteen thousand to five thousand eight hundred and fifty per year. So what led that? Well, so their competitor from Regeneron slash Sanofi, I think what what is it, Prowluent? I can never really pronounce it right. <laughs> they they had cut prices, but it, it was more kind of on the. I think it was more they were increasing the discounting. They didn't actually cut the list price. Okay. But so they, they, they did start so, some sort of like price competition there. And then also, I think, I mean, some people disagree. I think the Amarin data must have had some effect because Amarin's fish oil, which is relatively cheap, you know, had a 25% reduction in cardiovascular events. Right. So maybe they're just trying to get ahead of that drug. Yeah, it would make sense. I mean, that... The drug is already approved, but the this you know the cardiovascular outcome data isn't on the label. They they need to get approval for that. Um, but yeah, I mean it's it's if you're more expensive and you're less efficacious, it doesn't look really great for you. So they, no. they really needed to cut that pricing gap a bit because look, they they treat different things. Uh, Rapatha and the PCSK9 is really focused on LDL while Amarin's focused on triglycerides. So, so we'll see. And then um, one, one more thing, on, one, one thing on Amarin is, so people keep talking about the, this mineral oil issue, which I think is just hilarious. What do you mean a mineral oil issue? So in some of the placebo trials, you know, they don't give them the fish oil. They give them, they give them an oil. Okay. So they give them mineral oil. Right. So some people have, focused on some studies that have shown that that mineral oil actually increases your cholesterol. So they're saying kind of the placebo is bad. Okay. And and it's hurting the patients. And so like, let's say that that 25% change, some of that or much of that is from the placebo just being something that raises cholesterol. Huh. And, but this is an old issue. This, this issue was, was talked about at an FDA panel five years ago with the same drug. Right. The design of this cardiovascular outcome still was signed off by the FDA. Uh, you know, so the, I don't think they care about mineral oil. And if you look at like the, the kind of the, the literature as a whole, a lot of the placebo controlled studies that don't have mineral oil also had similar increases in cholesterol. Right. Uh, as we as we saw in you know some of the amarin studies or or other mineral oil placebo studies, so there's it's it's inert, yes. doesn't really do anything, but you know it just reminds me like sometimes when when people are bearish on a company or short the company, they like clasp on to these tiny little details and just forget kind of the big picture. We had the same problem with GW Pharmaceuticals. A lot of people were focusing on this drug interaction issue with Clobazam. Mm-hmm. I mean, all you do is you talk to um, you talk to a doctor, and they're like, "Yeah, a lot of these drugs have uh, for epilepsy have interaction issues. We just kind of work around it." Right. And then you know the data was always really good, but people were just thinking, "Oh, you know, the FDA is never going to approve this because it actually only works by making Clobazam work better." But that didn't like really make sense because it also worked in other patients where there wasn't a drug in their in their regimen where there's an interaction right and also it, i remember people were doing similar things with cell gene when 
revelment was was uh being approved you know you just latch on to these little things like a few patients with some sort of weird adverse event or or whatever, and you think the, the drug is going to get dinged, and then you just get steamrolled because it's like you missed the big picture. Well, people don't like to admit when they're wrong. No, they really don't. <laughs> so that definitely falls into that category, uh, just looking for something to hold on to. Yeah, no, exactly. So you get, I mean, it's just called confirmation bias also. Exactly. Yes, that's the word I was looking for. Yeah, it, it's, uh, and it happens quite a lot. You, you just like hold on to these things, and like it's not, it's not going to be an issue Literally, the mineral oil issue was talked to death five years ago. Right. And then if people have started bringing it up again, and it's it's not going to be an issue. Um, I don't think there's going to be... I'm sure there'll be some some wonkiness to the data somewhere, like some imbalance, whatever. But they have a huge margin of error. Huge. So, like, they, they don't... This would have been a successful trial at 15%. And they, they come out with 25 So they have a lot of room. I mean... You know, for for a lot of weirdness that could have happened in the process of the trial, I don't think it will be anything actually major at all. I think uh, I'm I'm more concerned with their uh, intellectual property, but kind of less so now. I don't know after I looked into it a little more, but it is sort of what did cool. you find? Oh, I think there was about four paragraph four filers. Okay, because it's not hard to actually make it. Right. Um. I mean, it's it's you you can get it on store shelves close to pharmaceutical grade but but teva did a you know they settled and they settled said that they wouldn't launch till 2029 and if it was if they had a really good um case in terms of you know invalidating or getting around patents i, I don't think they would have settled for, right exactly for, for a year that far away um so there's still other paragraph four filers we'll see what they do especially with this data because this makes kind of the generic you know more valuable but you know, if uh, I mean, if it doesn't look good, I don't think they'll want to waste the legal fees. So anyway, again, you know, so that's uh, promising. No, it's very promising. And, um, you know, I, I at least think it's it's helped reduce the prices of the PCSK9. So uh, hopefully some of the insurance companies also make that more available to patients. Cool. In other news, what do we want to talk about? Well, we, we have a lot. About... We have a lot left. Yeah, I know. We discuss. Have... We have so much. I know we have a lot. It's it's really amazing how much can come out in like one week. I mean, even even the, just this morning. So, uh, well, one thing that one thing that's kind of you know off topic from like actual drugs was just I saw that Sam Isley is suing Stat News. I did see that as well. You no, know, and and uh, because they came out with a story about how I don't know I don't think he was really necessarily harassing, but he was like mistreating women. Right. And. You know, so he's suing Stat News and the reporter who came out with the story. I mean, I don't know. Like Separately? For, well, I mean, in the in same suit. Same suit. Yeah. So, yeah, Damien's not, I don't think, hiring like a separate lawyer. I think he's, I, I think he's just, you know, using the, the firms. I mean, Stat News is part of Boston Globe. Um, you know, they, uh, they have quite a few resources. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, I think it's going to be, I mean, this was a very long, well-researched article that quoted witnesses I don't know how you can really sue someone for defamation for that. I mean, right. I guess you can sue them, but I don't think you'll win. No, absolutely It's, it's really not. hard to win these suits against reporters unless it's, like, really blatant. And, you know, the fact that Sam Isley had to step down, like, a few days later after the report came out doesn't, like, make it look very good. Because, exactly. you know, obviously his board thought, the report was likely accurate or 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 at least like it's it, there's a risk that it, it was accurate and um i i just i think it's almost like this is just revenge litigation like he's still pissed off because you know i'm sure people still snicker behind his back or don't want to get involved with him because of what you know this stuff i mean even though he, he created orbimed i mean exactly he did, like a really big firm he's obviously incredibly smart very talented, but now he's kind of his name has been besmirched, so he's pissed off. And right, and they took something that he created away from him. Yes. Um, so now, he, I mean, really, he probably, I mean, he'd have fun in retirement anyway. I mean, he's he's so incredibly rich. Uh, but like, I don't, I don't think sue, you know, I don't know, suing the press is really, it's really dangerous. And never, and I think Mark Twain said like, never go to war with someone who buys ink by the barrel. <laughs> yes. So yeah, that 
that was kind of interesting, but I'm we're definitely uh, rooting for Damien. I don't really think he has much to actually worry about. It's just going to be annoying having to deal with lawyers, right? You know, because I mean, I'll I'll tell you what I think about lawyers. I mean, I look, <laughs> I, I like some lawyers. Um, they they are very useful, but like it just. Whenever I think of litigation, I think of of that joke about like what's the difference between a lawyer and a catfish. What one, is it? One's a scum sucking bottom feeder, and the other one's a fish. <laughs> so anyway, I'll, I'll well, I just I, had I, I just had like four or five friends pass the bar. So oh, great! Yeah, so I'm excited for them to get started on their. Oh no! Look, I some careers. of my best friends are lawyers. <laughs> um, no, it's just you know, like for example, it's. You know, a lot of times in litigation, you know, it, it, it's an exercise in making, you know, taking whatever their their experience and your money and turning it into their money and your experience. So, uh, but, you know, anyway, that's just, that's, that's just a tangent. You know, this is um, just going in another direction. So this has been an interesting week on the markets. Yes, it has. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, like yesterday, which was Wednesday, I saw the XBI was down about 7% in a day. I mean, that's crazy. And it was down the day before, too. Mm. Not as much, but still. Yeah, I mean, it's it just like, it's like the bottom fell out. And, and this was before this Trump pricing thing happened. Um, I wonder if, like, maybe it was leaking or something to some of the top firms that have, like, all those contracts with DC right. specialists or something. But... I mean, it was just like an amazing kaboom, um, and the you know the you know the cannabis market that's really taken a taken it on the chin. I mean, it's it's pretty it's it's down significantly. I mean, look honestly, it probably needed to. You know, I mean, look, I'm not look. I, I cover cannabinoid stocks. I'm not saying like that there isn't you know, great things ahead for you know kind of the industry. What do we spend in the U.S. about? I think eight billion dollars on legal cannabis last year, and you know I think we're, we're we'll probably triple that just based on kind of the wave of legalizations across the country. You know, you just look at how how big the states are. I mean, you, and so there's a lot going for it. But it's just you look at some of these companies that. You know the, the valuations like of Tilray and all these things. I mean, they, you know, they they were just going up based on a bunch of Canadian investors with a lot of wheat stocks on margin, and I don't think that uh, that was very that that wasn't very helpful because like you know you, you get overextended and you know things swing like a pendulum and now it yeah you know, it's 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 gone things have gone down quite a bit and they could go down even more. Yes. Because, you know, a lot of these things still have pretty hefty valuations despite having low revenue bases, not necessarily a lot of uh, actual, like, growing capacity. Because I was shocked. I was looking at some of these companies, and I'm like, so, like, right now, they maybe they can have, like, peak, like, 50 million in revenues? I'm like, they can't even profit from this. You know, like, Canada's legal now, but they can't – actually seeing the sales for – from that is, is going to be difficult for some of these companies. So do you think that legalization would hurt these companies? No, or not at all. No, no, it helps them because it, I think what happened was a lot of people bought in, buying in for legalization. And then when it happened, they just start to crash out because it's like, okay, now you got, it, it's sort of like when biotech companies go up into FDA approval and then you know, they start going down after FDA approval because all the analysts are like, okay, now we got to think about the real world and right. what's actually going to happen. And things usually take take longer than you think. You know, I, I believe the saying is a clear view is not necessarily a short distance. Yes. So, you know, things will take time. You, you got to get licenses. You got to actually set up the shops. You got to get distribution systems. There's also like all these things on, you know, pricing. I saw charts from... Uh, I think like Colorado and like Washington, you know, prices per gram keeps going down, uh, which is why, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, so, some some of these folks are working on biosynthesis, which might be a cheaper way to actually, you know, make cannabinoids, um, at least if you, you know, you're looking for something other than the flower. Right. So, so anyway, I mean, look, this, this happens just about every time, you, you know, that there's something exciting. You get, you get a bit of a bubble. And then good stocks crash with bad stocks, and then you know you, you hope the good stocks come out the other side. Right. I think we saw that with others. It's like, 
yeah, the internet became obviously very big, <laughs> but not all the internet companies did well. Yes. You know, so you have like, you have Amazon, but then you have like pets.com. <laughs> so, which was ridiculous. Um, I think they had a sock puppet spokesperson. What? I think they might have had a sock puppet spokesperson. Really? Yeah. What was this? Pets.com? Pets.com. I don't even know what that looks like. Yeah, it it was it, it was definitely ridiculous. So anyway, uh, the markets are uh, rather troublesome. I think a lot of it is China slowing. Um, also, you know, valuations. Oh, and it was actually kind of funny that um, my neighbor across the street asked me. So, you know, why are stocks down? Other than the fact that you know their their uh, their valuations are overextended. I'm like, well, I mean, that's kind of the reason. Like the when, reason. when when you know, it, it's funny. So I just finished reading Howard Marks's book on cycles and kind of one of his points was people seem to be most complacent about risk when times are actually the riskiest, which is, you know, when valuations are really high right. and you're not paid to take risk. And then they're most risk averse when their profit potential is the highest, which is, you know, a- after a crash and when things are low and everyone's panicking. So it's just kind of interesting, the investor psychology. Yeah, the book is actually really interesting. I'm about maybe a third of the way through the book, um, but it's great so far. Yeah, no, it, it's an interesting book. I, I definitely recommend it. So anyway, I mean, we'll, we'll see how it hap- what happens. I mean, this is October. Octobers are always kind of, or usually kind of troublesome. We'll see if there's like follow through with that. So in other news, so there's a company, Selecta, which they're developing a drug for for gout. I believe it's severe refractory gout. Mm-hmm. Um, so if you know, they would be competing with Cristexa, which used to be from Sabian. So I don't remember who's developing now because Sabian went bankrupt. But uh, you know, like the refractory gout market is actually like by the numbers, it should be big, but it's actually relatively small. Um, but Selecta did some some data manipulation. So they were they were saying that their response rate was close to um, like I think it was like sixty six or sixty seven percent that they had responses in twenty one out of thirty two patients. But if you read closely, you saw that they did not include um, any patients who withdrew or had a severe adverse event or anything. So the, the real response rate is actually only 45%. So it's 21 out of 46 patients because 14 patients just weren't counted. Right. And now they're, they're basically kind of in line with Cristexa. And I think the Cristexa data with methotrexate is pretty much like a hundred percent. So not quite sure where, where these guys will be in the market. So did they explain why some of the patients withdrew? Was it because of the severe adverse events? Like, I mean, some patients just withdraw from the trial. Like, that is expected. Yeah, I don't know what the mix was. I mean, it's always a mix. There's always, I mean, sometimes it's just, you know, loss to follow up. They, they might exactly. Some Some people just move. Uh, some people just don't, just stop coming. Um, some, you know, uh, some people withdraw because of SAEs. I mean, what they presented was more of a completer's analysis. Yeah. Rather than an actual intent to treat population sort of analysis, uh, which is what you would like to see. Right. And so I know uh, we'll see. I mean, obviously, they're going to at some point they'll have a panel in the future and we'll see what the FDA says about it and what the panel members say about it. Um, Because, I mean, I don't know. I'm not sure if this is really an unmet need here. Right. Or how big of an unmet need it really is. Now, another data set that was kind of interesting, but the, the I think in the, in the case of Selecta, the, the stock price went down, but in the case of Dynavax, it actually went up. So they presented their data in combination with Keytruda for SD101, which is, it's an intratumoral injection in, for melanoma. So they basically injected into people's actual lesions. Right. You know, they got, they got a response rate, but... You know, it wasn't really that fantastic you know, because, I mean, they are getting Keytruda as well. Um, and it just also reminded me of this completely ludicrous company from a few years ago that was, you know, really promoting their their data. They had an intratumoral drug in melanoma and it was called the company was called Provectus. And if you remember Provectus, it's 
Red Dye number 102. Yeah. Um, I believe it's called, uh, also known as Rose Bengal. So essentially, it, ju- it burns off the tumor. That's how, like, the Provectus drug worked. And it had, like, similar response rates to the Dynavax data. And guess what? Nothing ever happened with it. Like, I just don't understand what's the point of these like intratumoral injections. Like, can't you just use, a, get a surgeon to just excise them? Exactly. Just them just, like in other ways without having like a drug? Because what do you need the drug for really? Right. You can just scoop it out. It seems a little more efficient and probably less expensive. We'll see. We'll see what happens with that one. Did the red dye trial ever move past phase two? No, uh, I don't remember actually. Um, they might have started it, but like it, it was a real mess of a company. Yeah, let's just say that. So like the management hadn't done a trial for like four years, I remember, and they also got sued by an investor for paying themselves more than what their employment agreements stated they should be paid. So uh-huh. they had to pay back millions of dollars. Okay. I mean, this, so this was a mess. Like, they literally were doing nothing but promoting the same data, you know, just trying to get, they had no institutional investors. They just tried to get, like, these retail guys to get excited about their latest press release would be like, oh, we're, we just met with potential Indian and China partners. So all these guys on, like, Seeking Alpha or Twitter or whatever would be like, oh, my God, you know, the Indian and Chinese markets, that's like 2 billion people. This is going to be huge. It's like, really? You think the IP of Red Dye number 102 is really going to be, be a huge seller in those right. places? Like, they'll just copy it, and they'll, I mean, there's literally almost no IP on this thing. Exactly. I mean, there's no composition of matter patent. Right. And I'm like, I think they had some used patents in the U.S. or something. It was, it was just a ridiculous thing. And, I mean, Dynavax, I think, has a better patent portfolio, but, you know, the data, the data just looked really similar, so I don't know. It, it was very deja vu for me. So, other than that, let's see. Oh, yeah, and then uh, Adaptimune had some data uh, for their um, TCR drug. Um, they actually showed 0% response rates, and but with the majority of patients having severe adverse events. Yes. So, if I can see a worse patients. profile, I don't know what it would be other than maybe menlo just because menlo had was worse than placebo in two successive trials but like zero percent response rate and you cause of your adverse events i don't think you're doing it right right um no. so that's uh that's interesting and then oh speaking of a company not doing it right so there's this other company castle creek so they they recently i saw um they had recently raised $71 million or so. They're a private company. Okay. And they they soon after they announced that raise, they announced that their phase two trial failed in epidermis bullosa. And, but they were going forward with phase three. That makes sense. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I, I don't know who gives these people money. I mean, like, the, the data for this drug has been consistently bad. Right. Um, I don't have the I don't have the name in front of me, but, like, uh, it, it's just, like, an old – it's just, like, an old product that they've kind of repurposed for epidermis bullosa. And, I mean, their previous trial, I remember, they had, like, data in five patients, and they would – treat one armpit with their drug and the other armpit would have placebo and then they would measure like lesion reductions. And so they were the same in both ar- – well, actually, they treat both armpits with their drug. Wait, what was the indication? Epidermis bullosa. Oh, okay. And then they switched the left, ar- the left armpit for people to placebo, but then the numbers didn't really change that much. So it kind of like, okay, so maybe the whole thing was a placebo effect. Right. Because otherwise you would think maybe the lesions would come back or whatever. Um, I mean, there is, uh, you know, epidermis bullosa, that, it, it's a horrible disease. It's, yes, it um, is. You know, if uh, you're familiar with it, the docu- there's a documentary in the UK or from the UK that was called The Boy Whose Skin Fell Off. I mean, these p- patients really have very fragile skin. There's a lot of like, bandages constantly whatever but you know they they do heal 
Um, and just they just got new ones. But the like the FDA endpoints, like the approvable endpoints for this seem to be, or what the FDA has historically looked for, are kind of wound healing over the course of, let's say, three, four, three to six months or so. Okay. You, you get really high rates of healing even without a drug. Yeah. Because, I mean, they do have – they're using other things. They're using bandages. They might use honey. They, you know, they're going to use what they use, and, you know, they do – work somewhat i mean it doesn't none of this will cure the disease this is all just Symptom symptomatic relief. treatment right yes like, like i i remember i seem to remember the so amicus bought this company for i think it was quite a lot of money and then that drug for epidermis bullosa failed and it, it was a very high uh, placebo response rate like 50 or 60 percent and I think these guys probably had like something similar in the phase two and yeah they're going forward with phase three i mean i i really it's really hard to get an epidermis bullosa drug to to make it through a trial. Right. It's very hard. Just a high response rate. I mean, it, it's hard for any wound healing drug. Yes, that's and true. And then here, I mean, there's just so many. It's it's just really tough. Um, I believe the drug was called is well, it is called topical diacerin. So it's used to treat joint diseases such oh, as yeah, osteoarthritis. Right. It's, it's an IL-1 receptor yes, drug. Yeah, I exactly. That. Yeah, so it's approved for osteoarthritis in, I think, Europe and maybe like Japan. So now they're they're trying to use it for epidermis bullosa. I'm not quite sure I understand that mechanism of action. Yeah, but- it's the, it, it's a, there's a roundabout mechanism of action thing going on with that one. Just like with, with a lot of them. I mean, you, you kind of need to have something that targets a lot of different things at the same time for something to work, right. I think. Um, and also, ideally, if you have something that goes for the root cause, I mean, this, this is usually caused by a genetic defect. So I don't know. But somehow these guys were able to get $70 million, including from, um, I think, Fidelity was one of the was was one of the investors so I don't know. I mean, they uh, they apparently saw the interim data from this trial that showed that it was not working at all. Because I think it, w- it wasn't actually the data. It was just like the DSMB said, you need to stop because it's futile. Okay. So I don't know. Maybe just in kind of the market that, it, that it's been, they're like, well, it doesn't matter if it works or not. We're going to invest because things have tended to go up a lot. And, you know, these guys can go public and whatever. Might not work out this way if this the market uh, continues to be like it's been. Anyway, there, there's other news that we can talk about, but I think we'll bid adieu for this episode. Thank you for listening. Thank and, you. And, you know, please subscribe and uh, review us on iTunes. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Our theme music is by Hazard.